a very warm welcome to everyone here. And uh, it's quite a honor and a privilege to have a man who doesn't need any introduction from my side or anyone. I won't waste time in introducing him. Can we have Mr. Edward Snowden here, please? Live from Jaipur, I'm here uh, with my friend Pratik. We are both going to put you questions. And in the audience, we have uh, young journalism students from almost 20 universities in the country and, and some journalists as well. That's the audience setup we have right now. So the very first question, you know, uh, before we get on with it, is that these are all bunch of youngsters who don't mind sharing anything and everything. You know, they feel absolutely uh, all right with sharing all information that they have. Uh, privacy is no concern for them. How do, uh, in a scenario like this, when they open up on everything, how big is an issue is privacy? Where did that argument originate from? And the answer is Nazi Germany, right? Uh, the Nazi minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, did this because he was trying to change the conversation away from uh, what are your rights uh, and what evidence must the government show to sort of violate them, to intrude into your private life, and instead say, why do you need your rights? How can you justify your rights? Isn't it strange that you're invoking your rights? Isn't that unusual? But in a free society, this is the opposite of the way it's supposed to work. You don't need to explain why you have a right. You don't need to explain why it's valuable, why you need it, right? It's for the government to explain why you don't deserve it. Uh, they go to a court, they show that you're a criminal. This is increasingly falling out of favor because governments and companies think it's inefficient, it's too much work. Life would be easier, life would be more convenient for them, life would be more profitable for them if we didn't have any rights at all. But privacy isn't about something to hide. Privacy is about something to protect. And that is the very concept of liberty. It is the idea that there can be some part of you of your life, of your ideas that belong to you, not to society. And you get to make the decisions about who you share that with. Since when you first came out with the revelation, uh, till that point in time, not everybody was too aware that they are being looked into. But now, what has changed over these five years? Now we know we are looked into, but what is it that we could do to safeguard it? And rules are being made that we share information mandatorily. We're talking about where mass surveillance comes from. Of course, no government is going to say, we decided you don't have rights anymore. Uh, we did it secretly. Um, we changed the rules. Maybe we'll pass a law, maybe we won't. But the new practice is to monitor everyone everywhere because they might be a criminal. Instead, uh, you get them saying they're doing you a favor to protect your life, uh, to protect your home, to protect your money, uh, to protect the public budget. Uh, they're passing a new program uh, that's not a surveillance program. It's an identity program. Uh, the framework for mass surveillance today would look a lot like the Aadhaar system, right? Uh, <laughs> and the, yeah, so, I mean, this is how it works, right? Uh, people in India have been hearing for years and years and years uh, these incredible statements um, out of the chiefs over at Uidai. Uh, every time they're criticized, uh, there was recently this controversy uh, about uh, Google phones uh, pushing the phone number for UEDI uh, into everybody's phone, right? Um, and somehow Google puts out a statement and goes, oh, it was our fault. It was inadvertent. It was a mistake. We have 95% of the market share. Maybe that's not the exact number. Please check the fact on that. Uh, but they have an extraordinary amount of the market share of India. You know, everyone in India is using a, uh, an Android phone, a Google phone, unless they're rich enough to afford an iPhone. 
And when you have that kind of position, it's very difficult to make a change that affects the phones of everybody in a country, right? And yet somehow, somehow, they managed to push this phone number to everybody. Now, you and I was not, uh, they were not concerned that this happened. Uh, they said, oh, the phone number's wrong. It wasn't us. It was Google's fault. It was somebody else. God, we, we don't know what happened, uh, but you shouldn't use this to attack the system. You know, it's wrong. It's saving you money. It's pe protecting people uh, from being cheated by, you know, people stealing benefits. Uh, and that's all you need to worry about. Anybody who doesn't agree with this system, their vested interests, their scaremongering, don't listen to them, right? But when we, when we start to look at this, uh, it, it, it gets a little bit strange. You know, the number one thing they always say in every public statement is your data is safe. Data hasn't been breached. Their biometrics are secure, right? But nobody actually said otherwise. Uh, the idea isn't that you can, uh, you know, go on the Internet and access anybody's our information directly. It's that it's being leaked. And, of course, this is how we get scandals like we've seen where officials from within UEDI are having their personal details, their private details, leaked by people looking up their ADAR numbers. The phone number that was pushed uh, by Google to all of these handsets uh, through an incredible mystery, no one knows how it happened, right? Uh, Google just woke up in the morning and said they wanted to do this. Uh, that doesn't sound convincing to me. But uh, the UEDI people said, oh, it's the wrong number. It's not even our number to begin with but it's the number that's printed on the back of your card, right? <laughs> if the people who are providing the card, if the people who are creating a mandatory enrollment system that is forcing identity uh, on people throughout the country to the point where there have been stories in India uh, that you cannot have a child and get a birth certificate for that child uh, unless you provide your ADAR number, um, Clearly, something in this system is not working. Uh, clearly, people have concerns that are not uh, unreasonable, but eminently reasonable. And if this is the case, if the public generally is concerned, if there is an unrelenting uh, train of scandals about this system, it seems that if this were a system that were concerned about the public's trust, they would respond to these in a reasonable way. They would look at the criticisms, they would address the systems, the, uh, the criticisms, they would reform the system instead of saying any criticism of us is illegitimate, it's scaremongering, and we just need to move forward. Now, anytime we're talking about protecting cheating on social benefits, right, it sounds like a good thing. But if that were all that Adar did, no one would have arguments against it, right? No one would be complaining. The problem is, and perhaps the biggest crime behind this system is that it's being used for things that are unrelated to what the government is paying for. Find in India right now a telecommunications company, a bank uh, that doesn't know what ADR is, even if the government's not paying for it, right? Uh, if you want to open an account, train ticket, are demanding an ADR number. And not just the number, they're demanding that you show them the physical card, right? This is creating a systemization uh, of society, of the public. And this was not the stated intention of the program. You'll see people at UEDI saying this is not what the program is for. Um, but if that's actually happening, how to address it, right? If the ADAR system is to survive and work in the public's favor, uh, the very first thing that should happen before this program uh, entrenches itself any further in society is there should be criminal penalties assigned to any company that asks for your ADAR number uh, for a service that the government is not paying for. If it is not directly funded by a social benefit uh, and the company asks for it, uh, they should not only be fined, right? Someone should go to jail for that. Uh, because if not, we all know what's going to happen. 
eventually you're not going to be able to go to the store. You're not going to be able to sign up for a service. You're not going to be able to do anything in society without showing a number. You will be tracked. You will be monitored. You will be recorded uh, in a hundred different ways and not by you die by the Adar number that they created that then is abused by every other company, every other group in society. Uh, there's only one way to prevent this, uh, and that's to reform the system before it goes bad. And unfortunately, it's already started to go bad. My question is to you that since you're very much aware as to what is transpiring in India, so a recent development uh, that privacy has been made as a fundamental right in India by the Supreme Court. So in today's world, when data collection and data mining is going on, do you think securing privacy is a Herculean task for the citizen? The question is who should be doing it, right? Um, do we want to create a society in which ordinary people who have jobs, who have commitments, who have uh, families to take care of, uh, whose hours are spoken for, have to all of them, uh, each individually become specialists in protecting their privacy and fighting a kind of technological battle against the richest and most powerful companies uh, in your country and in the world, as well as governments, both uh, within India, uh, state and national, uh, as well as foreign governments that are trying to spy on you as well, or... Should the government, these corporations and their policies uh, be designed by law to protect policy? Should the criminal code uh, be set such that the incentives uh, of violating someone's privacy or even narrowing someone's privacy unnecessarily uh, costs them more than it gains them? We have to ask ourselves, why do we have a privacy problem today? And the answer, of course, is because it benefits the people who are violating it. Uh, think about it. if you had a neighbor uh, who every time you left your house, uh, they followed you around with a notebook, uh, wrote down everything you did uh, and kept a record of it. And they did this for everyone in the neighborhood. Uh, and <laughs> when you confronted them, they in your house, Now, this is what is happening uh, due to the electronics uh, of the system today. The only difference is we don't see it. It happens invisibly instead of seeing the person with the notepad. Uh, the only way to change this uh, is to work on two fronts. We need to use both technology to enforce our rights through things like strong encryption that companies and governments can't interfere with. Uh, so we protect our rights on the technical level. And then also on a legal level, uh, we need to make sure that our rights are enforced and enforced meaningfully. If our rights are violated, there should be a penalty for that violation. Um, and then finally, and this is perhaps the most important thing for the people in this room today, uh, we have to know about it. When we think about the Adar system and where the scandal started, when we realized uh, in places like India uh, that all of this information that they say is absolutely secure in their database uh, is available to anybody over WhatsApp if you provide the number to someone who's working at UEDI, who's working at Adar and wants to make a little bit of money on the side. Uh, we need journalists. We need investigation. We need people uh, like Rock Nakara who are willing to risk something, willing to dare to be criticized by the government, uh, willing to face uh, police investigations and things like that, to tell the public what they need to know. Because if we lose that, it doesn't matter if India is a democracy on paper, it ceases to become one in fact. Because every democratic government uh, gets its legitimacy from a single concept, and this is that people understand what the government is doing and they consent to it doing that. If the government's activities are happening without our knowledge, uh, without our consent, uh, without our agreement, they're not legitimate. It's not democratic.
Uh, you just mentioned that you know uh, you need journalists and people who can come out and and take the government on. With this whole digital surveillance happening and the government looking at it, how can freedom of press uh, stem the tide of surveillance? Yeah. So this is this is uh, this is a difficult challenge because it's very much an unfair fight. Uh, on one side, you have. Uh, <laughs> governments with spy agencies and armies. Uh, on the other side, you have companies uh, with their billions. Uh, and on the public side, you have a few journalists uh, working at newspapers uh, that don't have very much money, right? Um, but what they do have is the truth. And that's something that can't be changed, right? Uh, we need journalists in a free society. Uh, not to simply write down what the government says or a com what a company says uh, and report that. Uh, that's not reporting. That's not investigation. Uh, that, that's note taking, right? Um, instead, we need them to look critically uh, at the activities of the most powerful members of society. Uh, we need them to work adversarially uh, against these people and go, are they really telling the truth? Uh, and then find out what the truth is, uh, and then tell the public that. Because this is how they become more powerful. Uh, newspapers, fundamentally, should be a public service. But it's important to remember that newspapers can't work without sources. People inside these organizations, governments and companies, who are willing to talk to journalists, tell them, where the truth is and where the lies are, um, and do this safely. Uh, if we don't have this, uh, which is a real possibility in India uh, without the efforts of group like, groups like Amnesty International uh, that are trying to create new whistleblower protections, um, we will run out of sources of information when the public needs them the most. To the earlier question, that journalists and cyber experts all over the world are facing uh, bro beating from the government. So how how your this organization of Freedom of Press Foundation could actually come to safeguard their interest and rescue them from that? So this uh, I'm the president of a group called the Freedom of the Press Foundation. Um, we take for granted uh, a lot of times that newspapers will continue to happen, uh, that we will have reporters, uh, that we will always have look people looking for the truth, right? But this is a hard job. Uh, it doesn't pay very well, uh, and it's very risky. And it, there's no guarantee uh, that this will continue. Uh, we see country after country facing a, a kind of new slide toward authoritarianism, even in the freest countries in the world. Uh, in the United States, we have Donald Trump as president, right? Um, and we see the world moving towards step-by-step uh, step, a sort of Chinese model. Um, and this is a dangerous thing. So the question, of course, is how do we prevent that? Uh, no small organization uh, like mine is going to save the world. Uh, but if we work together step-by-step uh, step, and we know what our values are, we can create a kind of solidarity to protect the values that matter the most to us. Now, we have to use new tools. We have to understand the technology better than our adversaries. But this can't be an expert fight, right? Uh, we can't think about, uh, are we going to be able to uh, outfox the spies, right? Um, instead, we have to think about, what is the future of our society? What is the future of our government? What is the future of this world uh, going to be based on? And either that's going to be based on social power from people like you sitting in this room who know what they believe in and are willing to stand up for it, are willing to risk something, are willing to dare to do the right thing despite the consequences. If we do this, if we make sure that those who interfere with the works of journalists are punished. And if we make sure those journalists uh, who stand up and 
do reveal the truth at great cost, uh, who are suddenly facing retaliation, do not face it alone. We can create a system of incentives, right? A, a blanket of safety uh, that protects all of us by not focusing on individuals, but focusing on movements, uh, by protecting values, by protecting rights. Uh, we can make sure that the next generation doesn't just enjoy the rights that we ourselves inherited uh, that are coming under attack now. They actually enjoy more rights, new rights. If we don't stand up, if we don't protect each other, and if we do not keep uh, fighting and striving and protecting the right to seek the truth and report it, uh, those rights will vanish. All right. And... Uh... While, while you say it's been going on and, and there are whistleblower acts that are coming out, you know, in India, as you mentioned briefly about amnesty, they are trying to, you know, uh, put the voice forward and say that there should be a whistleblower's act, but that is all going into a waiting game. Uh, with the governments more active, everybody more spying, you know, where do you see whistleblowers heading? <laughs> so this is... Uh fundamentally a question about uh, the public's right to know against the government's desire to hide. Um, we talk specifically about the government in this case, but more generally it applies to uh, corporations and other private groups as well. Um, but the argument here goes, uh, the public uh, needs to know what's going on in government. Um, but the government feels that if the public knew everything it was doing, its programs would no longer be effective. Um, if we know how the public is being spied on, uh, terrorists would know how the public is being spied on, and by proxy, how they're being spied on. Uh, and this would make things more dangerous for the world. But the reality is, if you look at the history of uh, terrorist activity, um, in the last 30 years, in the last 50 years, um, no one understands privacy, uh, or not privacy, no one understands surveillance um, better than terrorists. Uh, Osama bin Laden, for example, stopped using a cell phone, uh, not when he saw some recent story in the newspaper, he stopped using it in 1998. Uh, and the question, of course, is why? Um, the White House at the time said it was because, oh, newspapers were reporting too much information, uh, but there were investigations into this and it was found to be false. Uh, the actual reason he stopped using a cell phone uh, was because he was at a terrorist training camp and he made a call from his satellite phone uh, on one day. And then a few hours later, a missile struck the hill he had made a call from. Um, terrorists may be evil, uh, but they are not stupid, right? Terrorists will always know more than the public. And so this brings up the real question. Uh, when we see governments trying to deny the public access to information, uh, when they try to punish whistleblowers uh, and dry up the kind of journalistic sources that reporting relies on, uh, are they really acting in the interest of public safety or are they more concerned about political stability? Uh, are they really worried about security from criticism uh, rather than uh, safety against attacks? Going off gadgets could be one way, but it's difficult to do. You know, I, I remember somebody asking me the question that, what does Edward Snowden do when he's off his gadgets? <laughs> right, right. So uh, this is a question that's difficult for me to answer because uh, I am an expert, right? Um, so when we talk about how can you use technical services, uh, I can say do this, do that, uh, but it's very complex. It's very difficult. I can spend my whole life doing this. It's my profession, right? Uh, but it's not fair to ask an ordinary person to have to live like their Edward Snowden, right? I, I can't return home to my country uh, because I'm persecuted by my government for telling the truth about mass surveillance. Uh, violating the rights not only of Americans, but of Indians and everyone else around the world. Um, but we should not live in a world 
where ordinary citizens have to live and act every day as if they are hunted uh, by the world's most powerful uh, sort of secret police. Um, instead, we need to think about what does a world look like where you don't have to hide from gadgets that you bought and paid for, right? Um, and this is the problem. If you buy a phone and the government is pushing their phone numbers into your phone, uh, if the government is trying to push identity cards into your phone that you have to show everywhere you go, every time you try to register for some service, uh, you paid for the phone, but really someone else owns it. Someone else is deciding uh, who uses it, how it's done, how it's tracked, uh, who that information is available to. Does that sound right to you? Uh, and of course, the answer is no. Uh, if you are paying for a system, if you are trusting a system, if you, like so many young people in the audience, are opening up about yourself and sharing some information, uh, you should be the one making the decisions. Uh, not these other groups. Um, we shouldn't hide from our gadgets. Uh, there's an old saying that goes, in a free society, um, when the people are afraid of government, there is tyranny. When the government is afraid of the people, there is liberty. The question we need to be asking today is, which of those two expressions is closer to what we see today? It's a go you were software technology uh, professional, how do you see yourself today and where is it heading now? You know, you are on Freedom for Press and, and what lies next? You know, because there's, there's every time a suspicion that what is the next move? Uh, whenever Putin meets Trump, there is, a, there is a thing that, okay, what happens next to Edward Snowden? So I, I think this gets a little bit to the question that I, I get asked a lot, which is, um, Am I safe, right? Um, and of course I'm not. Uh, but if I were looking to live a safe life, uh, I would still be sitting in Hawaii, uh, in paradise, with uh, the woman that I love, uh, in a big house, uh, making a lot of money for very little work, uh, spying on all of you, right? But there are always going to be moments in our life uh, where we recognize we have a choice between doing the safe thing and the right thing. And sometimes the only moral decision is to break the law. Uh, I'm still a technologist today. Uh, <laughs> I'm more of an activist than I ever expected to be. Um, but the way I would describe it is I used to work for the government and now I work for the public. Let's work together and let's change the world. Miss America. Of course, you know, it's, it's my home. Uh, I want to go back uh, and I intend to go back, uh, but I will go back when my country is free, uh, when the trials are fair uh, and when telling the truth is not considered a crime. All right, Edward, thanks a lot for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much.